not one that I've preached before. Uh, it, this is this is hot off the press, so to speak. Um, but I'll I'll explain the title uh, in just a minute. But it's really good to be with you this morning. As as you may already know, school is opening tomorrow. It is a strange time for us um, right now with so many students unable to come to campus unless they have face-to-face -face labs. People were finding out two weeks before school started um, that they couldn't come to campus if they did not have face-to-face -face labs. So it's, it's interesting. It's strange. Um, there's upheaval on, on campuses all across the nation. Uh, most of you know I'm a campus pastor at UMass Amherst with an organization called Chi Alpha. <clears throat> but I'm getting reports from across the nation. Schools that were opening, uh, they were open for a week or two, and they were immediately closed because they were getting uh, tons of outbreaks, you know, people testing positive for COVID. Um, large groups of partiers gathering and... Uh, and getting infected and stuff, but <clears throat> yeah, uh, but in the midst of all of this, you know, we're really blessed to be able to have these kinds of interactions and continue to meet. Uh, man, if Paul had this in his day from the jail cell, you can imagine uh, how he would be on Instagram, he'd be on Facebook, he'd be using all of it. Uh, and he actually said, even with just a pen, just with writing, um, that uh, his imprisonment had had been for the good of the gospel. He was able to write the majority of the New Testament because of that. So the gospel is still going forth and good things are happening. Um, but we started a meeting with student leaders uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're gonna be opening our Freedom Cafe on Monday. It's gonna be takeout only, um, but we are opening up. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna be doing regular video chats as well as a, a streaming cafe for folks uh, that are back home or in their, in their parents' basements or tuning in from uh, different places uh, to see what's happening and, and, and stay connected, maybe join a small group uh, and be part of uh, Zoom chats like this. But yeah, it's, just, it's a strange time uh, to be doing campus ministry. Um, uh, but yeah, I've this, this whole week I've been meeting with students every day. Uh, and then Friday, a small group of us uh, got together to meet in person. But one thing that never changes <clears throat> about ministry, regardless of what's going on, is we're, we're trying to reflect, we're trying to glorify Jesus. Uh, and that's, if you're wondering why, why you're here this morning, you're wondering uh, what you're supposed to do with your life, uh, maybe you're in transition right now, it, you're, you, it is to glorify Jesus. That's why you're, you're on the planet. Even if you don't believe in him or not, you were created in his image and you are to reflect him. We are his image bearers. This goes back to the first chapter of the Bible in Genesis. Uh, so if you're, if you're here this morning and you're, you're wondering how to navigate this new normal, find ways to glorify Jesus. If you've been laid off uh, your job and you're, you're have, or you're, you're, you're having to, uh, to work from home, find ways to glorify Jesus. This morning we're going to look at uh, uh, an interesting passage of scripture. Uh, Psalms 133 is a very powerful passage about unity. Um, there's a quote by John Adams, one of our, our forefathers, uh, founding, founding forefathers of this nation. And he said this about the Constitution. He said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Uh, right now, our nation is being ripped apart for this very reason. We no longer have an objective standard of morality. Um, and so uh, we're very divided right now. And the church can be swept into the same division if we'll let it. But unity has never been a more important topic than it is right now. Uh, we need to be united. But before we read this passage, and I'll, I'll pull that up on the, um, on, the, on the slide here in just a second. So this, this, this psalm is by David, Psalms 133. And it's, David was a shepherd boy who became king of Israel. He wrote most of the Psalms <clears throat> or songs of the Old Testament, which the Old Testament, it refers to the first 37 books of the Bible, and the New Testament is the last 27. Um, uh, the Old Testament ends just before the birth of Jesus. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and read Psalms 133. I'll pull that up here. 
Is that coming up? Can you see that? Uh, Pastor Shane, we do see it, uh, but we, yep, uh, what we see, uh, maybe you want to do full screen or, but this, yeah, we, we okay. see the PowerPoint, but that's okay. fine. Let's see. Um, no. Okay, percent. Okay. All right, here we go. Perfect. A song of ascents of David, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron. Running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So some interesting uh, people uh, mentioned here and interesting concepts. So I try and I, I want to give something to everybody. So if you're new to the Bible or if you're, you've been studying for a while, everybody can get a little something. So it may be redundant for some of you. It may be totally new for others. Um, but I think this, I think this passage is, is really interesting because unity amongst brothers is not the norm. In the scriptures, it is anything but normal. Uh, it started in the very first few chapters of Genesis. You see the first brothers uh, at odds with one another. And Cain is jealous of Abel and he ends up killing him. Jacob and Esau, not too long after that, Joseph and his brothers, they decide to sell uh, Joseph into slavery. They wanted to kill him, but they decided, no, we'll just sell him into slavery. I mean, there's tension, you guys. There's tension <laughs> between brothers, and that seems to be uh, the normal. David had known uh, what it was like to live in disunity as well. And he grew up in a household of brothers that didn't think he was worth giving a second glance. When Samuel, the prophet, went looking for a king at Jesse's house, all of the sons except David were paraded before him while David was left in the field tending sheep. David was overlooked. And when he went to give his soldier brothers food for the war that was going on, they kited him, they reprimanded him for being there and for asking questions. It's not exactly a picture of unity. And this goes on and on. You even see the split of the nation of Israel into Israel and Judah. Israel and Judah. You see kings at odds with one another. You see civil war, all kinds of things. But here's David talking about the rareness and the uniqueness uh, when brethren or when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. David was a worshiper of God. He was constantly praying and seeking God. He was in communion with God. Uh, he thought about the laws of God. It says that he meditated on and he memorized them, uh, specifically the Torah or the first five books of the Old Testament. He did his best to live by those laws, honoring those laws. He wasn't perfect. That's one of the unique things about Scripture is it also tells the bad stuff as well. well when people didn't live up to their ethics and their morality. But he did his best to try uh, and follow those laws and reflect God by being in tune with him, which is what we want to focus on this morning. If we want a united church, then we must be united with him in Jesus. Now, I wonder how many of you have some familiar, familiarity in playing an instrument. Several of you, yep, several of you know how to, know how to play. I, um, I was able to uh, get my first drum set in seventh grade uh, and was able to get involved in uh, the high school band before entering high school. It was a lot of fun. Um, but I loved it. It was a great part of my life. Uh, I, learned, I learned how to to tune things, but, but it's different tuning a drum. Uh, the only thing that's, that's comparable is tuning timpani, the big kettle drums in an orchestra. Uh, but I wanna show you a clip of this incredible performance by an up and coming orchestra. So hopefully the sound comes through for you. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah, here we go. Is that coming through? Do you see that? Right, yes, here we go. yes. Uh, we don't hear the sound, though. Can you hear it? No. 
So you have to share uh, again, and then up the bottom you have to say uh, share the sound also. Oh. I think when yeah stop share and then okay. there's a uh, yeah. Just a second. Here. Sure. Thanks for for bearing with me. I'm still uh, learning the ins and outs of all of this. You stop sharing first, and then you, once you share, you have, a, there, there's a okay. left, yeah. lower left checkbox. Yeah. Uh, share again, that's your shame. Share. Okay, well, I hit share screen, but I don't see this share sound. How do I do that? There's a checkbox, low, lower left corner of your pop-up uh -huh. screen. Yep. Is there? Yeah. So you'll choose the video, right? The YouTube, what so, to share. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the bottom, there are some options like share sound. So when you start sharing, it's going to ask you what you're going to share, right? You're going to okay, choose. When I hit, okay, I hit share screen. Yeah. You okay. choose the YouTube, and I did that. but don't hit OK yet. I think oh, there's. Share computer sound. There yeah, it is. Yes. Okay, yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, that's fantastic. Now I learned, I learned a new trick here today. Okay. All right. All right. Here's, so here we go. All right. Here's this incredible performance. You ready? Okay. Um, are you still able to hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So, um, I don't know what you were hoping to hear after I said an inc incredible performance by an up and coming orchestra. Uh, but there's something missing from that performance, right? They weren't in tune then they weren't in the right timing. Now we, we can have a lot of grace with them because they were fifth graders, right? I was, uh, when I, when I was uh, growing up, I was, I was taking private lessons and I was studying like, I mean, not studying, but practicing like crazy. And I was able to attend and, and, and get involved in some honor bands and all state orchestra. And eventually I got a full ride scholarship uh, on music. I started off as a music major. I didn't end up as a music major, but I started off as a, uh, and so I was able to participate in the all state orchestra and these honor bands and, and eventually college uh university and the first thing that would happen the first thing that would happen uh is that we would tune and so if we weren't in tune no matter how well our rhythm was our fingerings our balance our dynamics it would sound absolutely awful <laughs> and when a group's not in tune they're dissonant and they sound like a beginner's band they sound like the, the last clip uh, but it was nice to be an honor band or state orchestra when i finally went to college to be in bands that knew how to play in tune. That was kind of a defining feature, uh, more even than the difficulty of the instrument. Okay, let me get you this next one here. So Pastor Shane, I I think you started talking, so I stopped your. Okay, audio. can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Did you hear anything I was saying about concert pitch? <laughs> no, no. I think it was mixed. Okay. In, I was hoping it would mix both, in. but apparently yeah. not. Okay. So I was just saying that um, that at an orchestral concert, you'll hear a, a concert A. You hear an A from the oboe before you hear anything else because it's the. Uh, it's the note that the rest of the musicians tune to. 
And that uh, the orchestra is tuned to an A, which is called concert pitch. It's 440 hertz or 440 vibrations per second. And it's, it's very convenient that it's an A because every stringed instrument has an A string. And for a lot of years, they would uh, tune to the A string of the first chair violin. But more recently, orchestras have been tuning to oboe's A because of its penetrating sound and it has a steadier pitch. There's a lot of people familiar with the music who haven't tuned to the first chair violin, so to speak, within the church. It's an allegory. But they haven't tuned to the steady pitch or the oboe. They, in, in other words, in this analogy, they're familiar with the Bible, but they're not in relationship with the God of the Bible. Their life is not in tune with Jesus. And if your life isn't in tune with Jesus, if you haven't tuned in to his concert A, your life's going to be filled with dissonance. And dissonance is a note that needs resolve. And until our lives glorify Jesus, until we tune to him, we're, we're never really uh, resolved. Uh, additionally, if we want to have unity with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, especially during a divisive time like right now, we have to first tune our lives to Jesus. You see, in an orchestra, you don't tune to each other. Everyone tunes to the oboe. You don't expect people to tune to you either. If, if everyone expected to be able to tune however they wanted, it would be chaos. It would sound like the first video clip. <laughs> but you see, when we're in the same key, tuned to the same Savior, we'll listen for him to reflect him. We won't expect him to reflect us. We will evaluate and make corrections by reading the Gospels and see how Jesus responds and acts. And we won't be trying to change his pitch by assuming that the Bible needs changing uh, or, or updating or, or, or thinking that it's outdated in its stances. Uh, I was talking with a student just this week. We had an open Zoom uh, and he had just finished the New Testament and was going to start the Old Testament. And they were talking about skipping Leviticus. And I said, well, Leviticus is actually one of the most uh, relevant uh, books of the Bible to our generation right now. It, it has a lot to say about our relationship with God and about sex and about identity. Um, and uh, he said, well, I, I think uh, the Bible's views on sexuality are, are antiquated and outdated. And so I began to challenge that and talk, talk to him about, you know, how we derive our ethics uh, from the scriptures and that those things are still very pertinent uh, to today. So we want to, we want to reflect Jesus, not make a God that reflects our desires. Um, and then we're going to keep on tuning ourselves. We're going to keep on developing relative pitch. Um, I, I play guitar. And so if I get the one, the one string, right, I can tune all of the other ones, but I have to listen in to an actual E, uh, to, to tune that bottom string. Otherwise I won't be tuned to any other guitars that are in the room if I'm playing with other people and we play with other people. Um, but yeah, we need regular communion with Jesus and his Holy Spirit to be able to reflect him in his tuning. We had a student uh, a couple years ago named Josiah. He's actually been to the church and uh, jo Josiah had perfect pitch. That's one of uh, the cool, one of the many cool things about Josiah, but he had perfect pitch. So you could ask him for a, ask him for a concert A boom, he would just sing it to you. And it's fine. You ask him for anything. He could give it to you. Um, I don't have perfect pitch. G uh, Jesus is our perfect pitch, so to speak. Uh, there's no one with perfect pitch in that way except him. And so, uh, but we're, if we're tuned to the Savior, then we won't assume that there are always, that, that we are always on pitch. We realize that we need constant interaction with scripture. If you've ever played an instrument, you know that you have to constantly keep tuning yourself. And you'll see it if, you, if you've played in it or if you're watching an orchestra. You know, I play a little bit of saxophone. And if, you, if, you're, if your instrument is too sharp, then you pull the mouthpiece out. If it's too flat, you push it back in. And you'll see people doing that uh, during a concert. And we do that by constantly interacting with scripture. And so what I love about this, this uh, illustration is, you know, God is the writer of the music. God is the conductor. God is the oboe that we tune our lives to. And he has music that he wants to share with the world and we get to be a part of it. Now, next week, we're going to look uh, more at living in harmony and what that looks like practically to live in community in harmony with one another. But today we're focused on unity with Jesus, tuning our lives to him. You might even want to use the phrase tunity 
instead of unity. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a really corny joke, but uh, but maybe maybe it'll help. But yeah, uh, if we can't have unity with Jesus, we'll never have unity with other believers. And you know, as we as we grow closer to Jesus, we can have unity with people from across the globe. We can find brothers and sisters who are from very different backgrounds, very different uh, situations, very different um, uh, upraisings and, and, and different, different things and financial situations. But we, we can have unity whenever we're first tuned to Jesus. And so this, this idea of unity with Jesus, let's explore that a little bit. You remember when we, we started with Psalms 133, and it has this reference to Aaron's beard. And, and so if you're new to the Bible, this, this Aaron's oily beard <laughs> reference is going to be really strange. Uh, but you need to realize that Aaron was the first high priest. Uh, maybe you've heard of Moses. He led the, the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, he entered uh, uh, you know, in, into following, following God. And Aaron was the high priest who was working with him, and uh, he interceded on behalf of the people of Israel. He represented them to God. He would offer the sacrifices for their sins before God to pay for their sins. You see, back then, when a follower of God broke God's law, there was a fine. Just like if you break the law now, there's a fine involved. And so this was paid for by a costly sacrifice. They didn't have dollars and cents back then or credit cards. They had lambs and rams and bulls and, and things like this. And so the priests were in charge of those things. Aaron was the high priest who would rip, represent the entire nation of Israel before God. He'd present a sacrifice for the entire nation for sins that had not been paid for, possibly accidental sins, unintentional sins, but the sins of the whole nation. He'd feel the weight on his shoulders. So to be in that position, Aaron went through a special ceremony, as did, as, as did other uh, high priest after that, in, in which they would pour oil on the top of his head, and it flowed down his beard and even on to his clothes. It flowed downwards. It flowed from the head down. And oil in the Bible is a typology or a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And interestingly enough, Aaron is kind of a symbol of Jesus, a typology of Jesus, because Jesus is now in the New Testament. He's called our high priest. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. And as our high, high priest, it says in Hebrews, it tells us that just like uh, Aaron, the high priest, would offer the sacrifices uh, for people's sins um, in that holy of holies uh, that only he could enter. Jesus did the same. Jesus entered once for all, into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. That's in Hebrews 9, 12. Now, it also says of Jesus, our high priest, that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit to preach the good news and indeed to anoint all who follow him with the oil of his Holy Spirit, the oil of gladness. And so our high priest is anointed by God and now anoints us with oil. And so you see this picture happening, Isaiah 61. Let's see if I can pull this up here for you. Where is it? Um, yeah, here he says, the spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And then in verse three, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. That's good news. Our high priest anointed to anoint us. If you're familiar with the Gospels at all, you'll know that the disciples didn't always get along. They didn't agree, and they argued, they fought, they fought for power. Um, they weren't in unity until after Pentecost, after Jesus was crucified, after he was raised from the dead. And if you're here this morning and you, you find it hard to believe in the resurrection, I challenge you to read people like C.S. Lewis and Josh McDowell or Gary Habermas, a expert in 
the historicity of the scripture, specifically the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You'll find that there's really good evidence. In fact, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the most, uh, the most recorded uh, event of antiquity that we have to date. Uh, and if you don't have time to read a book, you do have time to read the book. But if you don't, I, I look up one minute apologist and you can see some short, uh, some short little vignettes about, about that that are really very convincing. <clears throat> but they weren't in unity until after Pentecost, after Jesus rose from the dead and he poured out his spirit on the disciples. So my question is, how did a ragtag bunch of misfits that can't get along, they're not in unity, they're not tuned to Jesus, uh, they don't act like him at all, how did they become the leaders of a movement that would change the world? They spent three years around Jesus. They got familiar with his music. They learned all of the keys, all of the time signatures, all the rhythms, so to speak, but they weren't unified. Now, certainly they were unified in the sense that they were all trying to follow Jesus and trying to learn from him and be around him, but they still had their own competing visions, their own selfish desires, their own motives. They needed the oil of gladness. They needed the oil of the Holy Spirit to unify them. Now, later in this passage in Psalms 133, it talks about the dew on Mount Hermon and on Mount Zion. Mount Hermon, just a little tidbit, Mount Hermon is generally considered the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus reveals himself to some of his disciples. They begin to see him for who he actually is and not who they want him to be. You know, we see in this psalm that the, the blessings of oil and do, the, both are liquids, and they both are seen as flowing down, right? So the horizontal blessing of unity between you and me is, is contingent upon the vertical blessing of being in tune with Jesus. The flow is from the top down, and it turns into unity this way, horizontal. This psalm is a song of ascent, so they would sing it on the way to Jerusalem. They're, they're gathering from all of the cities around Israel and they're walking together. They're marching to Jerusalem and they're singing as they're ascending the hill together. That's a picture of unity right there. As they're ascending in worship, unifying in that way, uh, the blessings were flowing down. And it's the same with us. As we ascend in worship to God, as we attune ourselves to Jesus, to the key of Jesus, uh, the blessings of unity flow down, unity with God and unity with each other. Let's talk about Pentecost for just a minute. Pentecost happens uh, in Acts chapter 2. We see this very significant. It's the, it's the birth of the church, really. Um, the disciples didn't come into real unity until the day of Pentecost, when they begin to understand that they'd all been tuning themselves to themselves. And on that day, they're in one accord, tuning themselves to Jesus in prayer. And the oil flowed down from the head of our Aaron, our high priest, Jesus, and on to the church. In Acts 1.14, it says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. With one accord. And what happened is they were going up the mountain in worship as they were seeking their vertical unity with, with Jesus. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God speaking through them all at the same time. They were all filled. They, it started with them with one accord in prayer. And then when they were on the day of Pentecost in one accord, in one place, God began to pour out his oil of his Holy Spirit on them. What a beautiful picture of Psalms 133 happening. God was bringing unity where there wasn't before. Teachings weren't enough. They needed to tune themselves to Jesus. You see, according to the scriptures, those who put their faith in Jesus are called the body of Christ. In Ephesians 4.12. 
we're called the body of Christ. It's like we're the body of our high priest, Jesus. And he's called the head of that body in Ephesians 4.15. So Jesus is our head. And the oil flowed down the head of our high priest onto the beard and onto the body of Christ. You see that? So as we, as we will see next week, this tuning to the key of Jesus, this unity with him that they experienced together in unified prayer led to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but also to the unifying of themselves. The community of Christ became an orchestra of God and his music began resonating in all the earth as quartets and ensembles and bands and sometimes just duets, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas. Paul and Timothy going out into all the earth to play the master's music. Jesus wants to unify us. So in closing, he says in John chapter 17, verse 21 through 23, that he wanted us to be one as he and the father are one. And that when that happened, the world will believe that Jesus is who he said he was. Read John chapter 17 in preparation for this upcoming Sunday. And we're going to talk about how that unit, what that unity looks like. When we're unified with him, it leads to unity with one another. And there's a blessing that comes from that unity. The end of this Psalms 133, it's there that the Lord has commanded a blessing life evermore. There's a blessing that comes from unity with God and with one another. And so if you're experiencing disunity with God, it's going to affect your relationships with, with one another at a church. Church division does not have to happen. It doesn't have to be the norm. If you're experiencing dissonance with others, it will affect your relationship with God. So I want to tell you, um, friend, God is calling you to repentance with him and to faith. In Jesus. Repentance means to turn away from your rebellion against his laws. If you're not currently obeying God's words, you're in dissonance with him. And it's time to turn from them and listen for Jesus' voice. And he's calling to us. He's calling to you today and offering you harmony with God. Will you respond to him? Yeah, he loves you so much. Um, so I just I want to challenge you. If you're not, if you're not a believer, he is... He, he loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to come into a relationship with him. If you are a believer and it's, it's been a while, or maybe you've never felt the touch of his, of, of his presence, of his oil, of his Holy Spirit. David talks about later in Psalms 92, verse 10, I believe, he says that God anointed him with fresh oil. You know, we're supposed to pray for da daily bread. I think we should pray for daily oil. That God would pour out the oil of his Holy Spirit on us every day. So I'm just going to pray over you. And I want to challenge you. If you're not a believer, talk to somebody in this chat room. Talk to Hannah. Talk to Noel. Talk to Ian. Um, tell them you're interested. You want to you do that. You want to commit your life to Christ. So I want to pray for you right now. Dear Jesus. Thank you that you are still in the business of bringing unity. You still want relationship with us, Lord. Thank you that you can be the glue that holds us together. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here right now who's not experienced you, that they would, that you just invade their room right now and pour out your Holy Spirit, pour out your oil on them, God. If there's people here who are like, you know, thinking like, I, I can't imagine myself being in unity with some of the people in that church. Maybe they have brokenness. Maybe they have unforgiveness in their heart. Maybe there are things that they're not unified with. Maybe they've not been able to forgive somebody. I don't know what the issue is, but I pray that you begin to speak to that. Lord, let them begin to dive into you and, and, and tune themselves to you. Pour out your spirit on them so that they could be in full fellowship and unity with the body of Christ. I pray your blessing on everyone here today, God. Thank you for their faithfulness to you and their faithfulness to come this morning. Bless them all, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.